like I said to you in my email, there was two subjects which I was interested in, the notion of the prime Jedi and the dyad in the rise of Skywalker. Good afternoon and good morning. Today I'm talking to Sophie Lacour from France. And Sophie has quite a long-term interest in Star Wars. And particularly, we have been talking recently about the rise of Skywalker. We're going to talk about a couple of issues today. And what I'm hoping to do, Sophie, is to tease out from you. You have a perspective about these movies, and I want to tease out how these things work from a psychological point of view. For an average person who's going to the movie, what does that do for them? And, and what is it doing? And what does story do? So, so you had some specific ideas of that you wanted to speak about today. So why don't you go ahead with that first? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, we, we need to uh, warn people who are watching these videos that uh, we, there will be spoilers. <laughs> so okay. if you haven't uh, watched the movie and don't want to, s to know what happens in the movie, you should uh, probably uh, not uh, keep on uh, watching it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, second of all, um, I have to say a lot of the ideas about the mythological themes of this movie, I've been inspired by uh, YouTube channels, which I watch very often about Star Wars. Their names are What the Force, Girls with Sabers, and uh, Lords of the Sith. I think we should say to people that we're thinking in terms of a series of interviews about Star Wars generally, or at least I am. I hope you are. First of all, the, the subject I, was, I wanted to talk about, it was inspired by Plato, the symposium, because uh, there is a, a part, I, don't, I haven't read the, the whole symposium, but I'm interested in one of the stories which is told by um, uh, one of the philosophers, Aristophanes, who, in which he explains the origin of love, the notion of uh, soulmates. I think it's interesting in relation to what we've learned in Mysterium Conjunctionis about how first the opposites are and differentiated in the pleroma, and then they are separated, and then there is a marriage uh, between the opposites. And all of this made me think about the notions, uh, the notion in Star Wars of the prime Jedi, which we see in the, the last Jedi movie, the eighth movie, and uh, the dyad in The Rise of Skywalker, which is a name they found, but probably the notion already existed in the, the eighth movie, but they found the name for it uh, in the eighth movie. So maybe I will read the definitions of these two Star Wars con concepts, which uh, have been written in uh, the an encyclopedia of Star Wars online. Um, do you want me to read them first or to talk about Plato's Aristophanes story? Because you have a French accent, which is quite natural, you, you being French, <laughs> it might be easier for our audience to understand if, if I read them. I'm going to read a few of the highlights that Sophie has brought to our attention. Okay, the first of these highlights comes from Wikipedia, and the first is the Prime Jedi. Okay, so here's the definition. The Prime Jedi was the first member of the Jedi Order. This individual founded the Order around 6,000 years before the Battle of Yavin on the planet Arcto. The first Jedi Temple, which was located on Octo, contained a mosaic of the Prime Jedi 
in a state of meditation and balance. This symbol is very similar to the yin yang uh, symbol. Obviously, yes. And so it represents the uh, primordial, it's like the primordial man. So this is what I was reading from, from Wikipedia. Go ahead and describe the mosaic again, please. Yes, yeah, so on the left, you can, um, the whole mosaic, you can see a, a man, a Jedi, who is in the yoga pose, we can say, and he has a, a saber, a saber, a lightsaber in, in his arms. On the left of his body is black, the right of his body is white. The background is white on the left of the picture, and yes. it is black on the, the right of the picture, and there is black dot on the left, and a, a, um, it's not actually white, but a, a clear uh, dot uh, on the right of the picture. So it's very similar to the yin yang symbol. And also the fact that it is a man, we can correlate this to the notion of the primordial man, which we learned uh, about in uh, Mysterium Conientionis, who was an androgynous man. And we, we will remember this and as we explain what Aristophanes is telling in his uh, tale of of the soulmates. In the Pleroma, which is an undifferentiated unity of everything, right? Would, would you accept that as the definition or a yeah. definition? That's how I understand it with my limited knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I understand it too. So it's an, under, it's an undifferentiated unity of everything in the universe. Okay, it's the background. It's like um, it's even before the Big Bang, but it's like the image of the, the primordial background wave or um, radiation that has been taken uh, in about 1957, I guess. Prime Jedi is equivalent to the primordial man as, as we studied uh, or He's called uh, Adam Kadmon in the Kabbalah. And uh, so in the Star Wars, it's, it's the equivalent. So it's a Jedi with, who is both dark and light. Right. We don't see it, but it's probably both uh, male and female as well. Right. And then maybe you can read the definition of the dyad. In the, second link, in the second link I sent to you. Dyad in the force, the life force of your bond, a dyad in the force, a power like life itself, unseen for generations. Darth Sidious to Ben Solo and Ray. Uh, so Darth Sidious explained that to, to Ben Solo and Ray. When did, when did he explain that to them? I think it's near the end of uh, the rise of Skywalker. Near the end of the rise of Skywalker. So the dark figure that she's fighting at the end of Skywalker is the Darth Sidious. Is that right? Yes. It's, uh, we also call him uh, Palpatine. Uh, Darth Sidious, it's his uh, Sith, Sith Lord name. Oh. But <laughs> He was uh, known as Chancellor Palpatine in the pre prequels and the emperor in the, the original trilogy. I see. So in the original tr trilogy, he's known as the emperor. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'll read on. A dyad in the force was the pairing of two force-sensitive beings, making them one in the force. The power of the dyad was as strong as life itself, and the individuals who form a dyad shared a connection that spanned across space and time. It was foretold in a prophecy that there would be a dyad in the Force, which had been unseen for generations by the time of the New Republic era. The prophesied dyad 
was realized within Kylo Ren and Rey, although they were enemies during the war between the First Order and the Resistance. Ren and Rey shared a unique bond that featured prominently in the lore of the Sith Eternal cultists. During the Battle of Exegol, the life force of their dyad was used to restore the Sith Lord Darth Sidious. Hmm. So which, which movie was this in? It was in The Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> it, it was in this movie itself? Yes. Okay, so... So what are Sith Eternal cultists? I, I think it's a, a sort of Sith temple uh, in which the, the souls of the Sith uh, rest. But I, I, I don't okay. know exactly. It's, it's Interesting, because this flew right over my head. <laughs> oh, it's, it's the first thing we see in the movie. We see uh, uh, Kylo Ren, who is descending to this uh, temple in Exegol. I see. And he, he sees big statues, statues big uh, st statues. Oh, he sees the big Sith statues there. Okay. Yeah. The significance of the dyad and the force, all of this just went right over my head entirely. <laughs> so I did not get this. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's interesting if we, if we now correlate this. Okay, let, let me read this what? next section, though. There's a quote from Kylo Ren here. My mother was the daughter of Vader. Your father was the son of the Emperor. What Palpatine doesn't know is we're a dyad in the Force, Ray. Two that are one. Ah, okay, so that... When does he say that? Um, In the I don't Skywalker? know exactly, but I think it's when they, they are fighting uh, each other. Okay, and this is in The Rise of Skywalker? Yes. Okay. Boy, I, I entirely missed it, these things. A dyad in the Force was phenomenon that occurred when two Force-sensitive beings shared a unique force bond with each other, connecting their minds across space and time. Physically, they were two separate individuals, but in the force, they were one. This form of connection made it possible for the bonded individuals to communicate with each other across great distances. The connection between Kylo Ren and Rey could cover a range of light years, allowing them to see and hear each other from across the galaxy. Their bond also gave them a clear sense of what the other felt, such as their fears as well as their feelings of abandonment and solitude. In combat, when the two who formed a dyad fought as one, their abilities mirrored and amplified each other. In the case of Ren and Ray, their force bond grew stronger with every passing moment. Wow. You know what this reminds me of is quantum physics and what we've been talking about, about quantum physics. What notion in particular? Well, the, the whole idea of this dyad, this whole description of the dyad is basically a description of quant quantum ent entanglement. It's basically a description of quantum entanglement. Yes, but not exactly. The notion that the two are connected uh, across a great distances, yes. But the two particles in quantum entanglement doesn't have, don't have to be opposites. Here we have a notion of connection, right. but we also have the notion of uh, union of opposites, which right. you don't I have in quantum entanglement. Okay, uh, I agree with that, but I, I think it, it's still sort of that notion, and it's trying to pull us along as an audience to see that kind of notion. Uh, but but uh, yes, I agree that it is similar in the sense that uh, in the physical realm, we have two particles, 
but maybe in another uh, dimension, they are one. Yes. Okay. Right. And maybe in another dimension, they're much more complex than just a particle within an atom because quantum physics relates to quanta, uh, quanta within an atom, correct? Yes. Right. I mean, it, uh, I mean, this was discussed by Einstein, right, in his light paper in 1905, the one that won him the Nobel Prize. He, did, he talked about uh, quanta of light being not physical things, but quanta. <laughs> Right, um, and then we had Ma Max Planck who described quantum physics, but here this is an elaboration on the idea of quantum physics, is it not? S to the suggestion that the idea of soulmate, and, and it's a very powerful idea, uh, the idea of soulmate, which goes back to Plato, Plato now, could be this complexity that quantum physicists and, and Newtonian physicists haven't even approached yet, haven't even started to approach. Yes, and you were talking about the, the pleroma before, and uh, on Wednesday, I, I was telling you that I had a si series of synchronicity uh, related to uh, uh, the... Um, Seven Summers of the Dead in uh, Jung's Red Book right. and, and Star Wars. And um, what, what I, I've, so I read uh, this part of the Red Book uh, on Wednesday and it also made me think about quantum physics because uh, in the Pleroma you have the, both the virtual particles uh, which the the opposite uh, virtual particles, which are exist coexisting, but if they want to uh, if they want to uh, be present in the uh, physical uh, universe, they they can be both present at the same time <laughs> because they would annihilate uh, each other. <laughs> you said they could not be present at the same time. Yeah, so they are in a state of uh, probability uh, right. in the quantum vacuum. And then one can uh, uh, enter into a physical existence. But when, when one enters into physical existence, then that's the manifestation, and the other one cannot. Uh, then the then the potential is gone. Then it then it's manifestation, correct? Yes, but yeah, what what I wanted to say is, is the whole uh, chapter made me think about that. The whole chapter of the seven sermons of the dead. Yes. Uh huh. Very interesting because he wrote seven sermons of the dead in the nineteen teens. He didn't even meet Wolfgang Pauli until about 1928, I think, something like that. Mm. And Wolfgang Pauli was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Wolfgang Pauli was a younger man, a generation younger than Jung. So he came to Jung for psychological help. And over the years, they developed a collaboration which did two things. One is uh, Pauli's dreams produced a complete dream journal of individuation in a very, as it appears, in a very bright man. And secondly, then they wrote a book together called Adam and Archetype, in which they discussed the uh, the uh, tran um, trans, uh, let's see, in which they discussed the 
the correlation between physics, particularly quantum physics, presumably, and psychology, which is what uh, Dr. Lothar Schaffer has uh, come up with in his book, Infinite Potential. Um, and so uh, it's very, very interesting to me that these correlations are now coming together. And I think even you are surprised when I bring up quantum physics here, right, or not? No, I'm not surprised. You're not surprised. <laughs> okay. You're not surprised because you already saw it in the seven sermons of the dead. Yes, and we, we know for a long time that uh, Jungian psychology is uh, closely uh, related to what they discovered in quantum physics. Right, exactly, okay. Um, <clears throat> and I know you're passionate about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm passionate. Right <laughs> I'm passionate about it right now because uh, this book of Dr. Schaffer has uh, piqued my interest further in that. And, of course, Newtonian physicists and quantum physicists still can't figure out the unified field theory. And it's my theory that the human being is the unified field. That's my opinion, but... Um, yes, human... Um, maybe not human being, but uh, uh, consciousness. Yeah, human say. consciousness as... or consciousness itself yeah. as manifested in human beings. Mm. Right, because there's no other animal that's manifesting consciousness per um, se. We can't be sure of this. <laughs> well, they manifest awareness, but but consciousness in the sense that we're talking about uh, has been, as far as we've gone, fully evolved in the human being. Now, that isn't to say it, we're fully evolved. It only says that we're the best example of consciousness evolved. Well, we don't know. We don't know uh, how uh, animals, um, how they are, cons uh, they are constituted. Uh, we don't know uh, if they can be... Uh, um, extracting information from uh, the other realms of unconsciously, reality. yes, collectively, yes. which obviously they, they do. Yes, you know, they, create, we we see that they they are intuitive. Yes, as as is incredibly shown. Uh, Debbie showed me a, a short video last night of a flock of birds, and you, you know you've probably seen these images of flocks of birds that all fly around together, and they form all these beautiful fractal designs, but they stay together, and they move very rapidly together. And what she showed me yesterday was a video of a man who's holding his hand up, or his two hands up, and he's actually directing the birds, and it's incredible what he does. It's truly incredible. From my understanding, animals are even more connected to the unconscious, but the, the difference is that human beings have a more developed and complex uh, conscious mind. Right, and that sort of flashbangs out our unconscious. In other words, we're, we have a more developed conscious mind, and therefore it's harder to see the unconscious. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting point. So it's a kind of dyad, actually. <laughs> like you're yes, it, it is. It is. And I think that's the, the real meaning. Men, and when we see the, the, the story of the Bible, uh, I've already told you uh, I am interested in a French woman who studied the, the Bible in Hebrew, and she, is also, she was also a Jungian psychologist, and uh, she uh, discovered that the first man and woman were not actually a physical 
man and a physical woman, like Adam and Eve are a physical man and a physical woman, but right. before, when what we see as a, we, we thought that uh, uh, God created the woman by extracting mm -hmm. um, uh, how, how you Yes, but actually it's a wrong translation. And uh, she explains that uh, actually the, the first woman that we see is the other side of Adam. So it's uh -huh. not a physical woman. And uh, so the message of the Genesis, according to, to her, is that the man, it can be a, a, a physical man or a physical woman. It's the same. They are both Adam. And they have to they have to marry their other side, which is the unconscious. Right, and of course, that's very difficult. This is why so many marriages end in divorce. Included, in fact, in the U.S., it's more than fifty percent, I think, because we're not taught that when you're marrying someone of the opposite sex, you're actually marrying the. Uh, the other side of yourself. And this is your point about soulmate, right? Yes, may, maybe it's, it's time to, uh, to talk about uh, Aristophanes' uh, uh, story. <laughs> Let me read it for people who are just listening to this video and cannot see this as they're listening to it. You say to me in your email, I've been thinking maybe we would read extracts from this text of Plato's Symposium about soulmates. Aristophanes professed to open another vein of discourse. He had a mind to praise love in another way, unlike that of either Posanius or Eryximachus. Mankind, he said, judging by their neglect of him, have never, as I think, at all understood the power of love. For if they had understood him, they would surely have built noble temples and altars and offered solemn sacrifices in his honor. But this is not done and most certainly ought to be done. Since of all the gods, he is the best friend of men, the helper and the healer of the ills, which are the great impediment to the happiness of the race. I will try to describe his power to you, and you shall teach the rest of the world what I am teaching you. In the first place, let me treat of the nature of man and what has happened to it. For the original human nature was not like the present, but different. The sexes were not two as they are now, but originally three in number. There was man, woman, and the union of the two, having the name corresponding to this double nature, which had once a real existence, but is now lost, and the word androgynous is only preserved as a term of reproach. In the second place, the primeval man was round, his back and sides forming a circle, and he had four hands and four feet, one head with two faces, looking opposite ways, set on a round neck, and precisely alike. Also, four ears, two privy parts, and the remainder to correspond. He could walk upright, as men now do, backwards or forwards as he pleased, and he could also roll over and over at a great pace, turning on his four hands and four feet, eight in all, like tumblers going over and over with their legs in the air. This was when he wanted to run fast. Now the sexes were three, and such as I have described them, because the sun, moon, and earth are three. And the man was originally the child of the sun, the woman of the earth, and the man woman of the moon, which is made up of sun and earth, and they were all round and moved round and round like their parents. Terrible was their might and strength, and the thoughts of their hearts were great, and they made an attack upon the gods. Of them is told the tale of Otis and Ephiatus, who, as Homer says, dared to scale heaven. 
and would have laid hands upon the gods. Doubt reigned in the celestial councils. Should they kill them and annihilate the race with thunderbolts, as they had done the giants, then there would be an end of the sacrifices and worship which men offered to them. But on the other hand, the gods would not suffer their insolence to be unrestrained. At last, after a good deal of reflection, Zeus discovered a way. He said, Methinks I have a plan which will humble their pride and improve their manners. Men shall continue to exist, but I will cut them in two, and then they will be diminished in strength and increased in numbers. This will have the advantage of making them more profitable to us. They shall walk upright on two legs, and if they continue insolent and will not be quiet, I will split them again, and, and they will hop about on a single leg. He spoke and cut men in two, like a sort of apple which is halved for pickling, or as you might divide an egg with a hair. And as he cut them one after another, he bade Apollo give the face and the half of the neck a turn in order that the man might contemplate the section of himself. He would thus learn a lesson of humility. Apollo was also bidden to heal their wounds and compose their forms. So he gave a turn of the face and pulled the skin from the sides all over that, which in our language is called the belly, like the purses which draw in. And he made one mouth at the center, which he fastened in a knot, the same which is called the navel. He also molded the breast and took out most of the wrinkles, much as a shoemaker might smooth leather upon a last. He left a few, however, in the region of the belly and navel as a memorial of the primeval state. After the division of two parts of man, each desiring his other half, came together and throwing their arms about one another entwined in mutual embraces, longing to grow into one, they were on the point of dying from hunger and self-neglect because they did not like to do anything apart. And when one of the halves died and the other survived, the survivor sought another mate, man or woman as we call them, being the sections of entire men or women, and clung to that. They were being destroyed when Zeus, in pity of them, invented a new plan. He turned the parts of generation round to the front, for this had not been always their position, and they sowed the seed no longer as hitherto, like grasshoppers in the ground, but in one another. And after the transposition, the male generated in the female, in order that by mutual embraces, a man and woman, they might breed, and the race might continue or if man came to man, they might be satisfied and rest and go their ways to the business of life. So ancient is the desire of one another, which is implanted in us, reuniting our original nature, making one of two, and healing the state of man. Each of us, when separated, have one side only, like a flat fish, like a fat fish, but the indenture of a man, and he is always looking for his other half. Men who are a section of that double nature, which was once called androgynous, are lovers of women. Adulterers are generally of this breed, and also adulterous women who lust after men. The women who are a section of the woman do not care for men, but have female attachments. The female companions are of this sort, but they who are a section of the male follow the male, and while they are young, being slices of the original man, they hang about men and embrace them, and they are themselves the best of boys and youths, because they have the most manly nature. Some indeed assert male, and while they are young, being slices of the original man, they hang about men and embrace them and they are themselves the best of boys and youths, because they have the most manly nature. Some indeed assert that they are shameless, but this is not true, for they do not act thus from any want of shame, but 
because they are valiant and manly and have a manly countenance and they embrace that which is like them. And these, when they grow up, become our statesmen and these only, which is a great proof of the truth of what I am saving. When they reach manhood, they are lovers of youth and are not naturally inclined to marry or beget children. If at all, they do so only in obedience to law but they are satisfied if they may be allowed to live with one another unwedded. And such a nature is prone to love and ready to return love, always embracing that which is akin to him. And when one of them meets with his other half, the actual half of himself, whether he be a lover of youth or a lover of another sort, the pair are lost in an amazement of love and friendship and intimacy and one will not be out of the other's sight, as I may say, even for a moment. These are the people who pass their whole lives together, yet they could not explain what they desire in one another. For the intense yearning which each of them has toward the other does not appear to be the desire of lover's intercourse, but of something else which the soul of either evidently desires and cannot tell and of which she has only a dark and doubtful presentment. Suppose Hephaestus, with his instruments, to come to the pair who are lying side by side and to say to them, what do you people want of one another? They would be unable to explain. And suppose further that when he saw their perplexity, he said, do you desire to be wholly one, always day and night to be in one another's company? For if this is what you desire, I am ready to melt you into one and let you grow together, so that being two, you shall become one, and while you live, live a common life as if you were a single man, and after your death in the world below, still be one departed soul instead of two. I ask whether this is what you lovingly desire, and whether you are satisfied to attain this. There is not a man of them who when he heard the proposal would deny or would acknowledge that this meeting and melting into one another, this becoming one instead of two, was the very expression of his ancient need. And the reason is that human nature was originally one and we were a whole, and the desire and pursuit of the whole is called love. There is a time, I say, when we were one, but now because of the wickedness of mankind, God has dispersed us as the Arcadians were dispersed into villages by the Lacedaemonians. And if we are not obedient to the gods, there is a danger that we be split up again and go about in basso relievo, like the profile figures having only one half a nose, which are sculpted on monuments, and that we shall be like tallies, Wherefore, let us exhort all men to piety, that they may avoid evil and obtain the good, of which love is to us the Lord and minister, and let no one oppose him. He is the enemy of the gods who opposes him. For if we are friends of the God and at peace with him, we shall find our own true loves, which rarely happens in this world at present. I am serious, and therefore I must beg Eryximachus, not to make fun or to find any illusion in what I am saying to Pausanias and Agathon, who, as I suspect, are both of the manly nature and belong to the class which I have been describing. But my words have a wider application. They include men and women everywhere. And I believe that if our loves were perfectly accomplished, and each one returning to his primeval nature had his original true love, then our race would be happy. And if this would be best of all, the best in the next degree and under present circumstances must be the nearest approach to such an union. And that will be the attainment of a congenial love. Wherefore, if if we would praise him who has given to us the benefit, we must praise the God love, who is our greatest benefactor, both leading us in his life back to our own nature and giving us high hopes for the future. For he promises that if we are pious, he will restore us to our original state, 
and heal us and make us happy and blessed. This Eryximachus, leading us in the life back to our own nature and giving us high hopes for the future, for he promises that if we are pious, he will restore us to our original state and heal us and make us happy and blessed. This Eryximachus is my discourse of love, which although different to yours, I must beg you to leave unassailed by the shafts of your ridicule, in order that each may have his turn, each or rather either, for Agathon and Socrates are the only ones left. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, yes, thank um, you for, for reading this quite long text, but I yeah. think it was uh, important to to know the whole story. The and whole the, story, right. Yeah. Okay, all right. So so now we have to go back to uh, the dyad and the love. You were talking about that. So why don't you go back and explain why you were introducing this section of the symposium in the context of Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker? Well... I, actually, uh, the the text you you've just read uh, explain how men were originally yes uh, not uh, actually the the text is even more subtle because it also explains homosexuality. Oh yeah, so, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. so uh, there were uh, three sexes. There were uh, men, women, and androgynous and the the, ori the original men who were uh, either men and women became uh, homo homosexual when they were split in two whereas the androgynous uh, men when he was split in two became a uh, heterosexual <laughs> so right. it's, it's funny uh, that uh, he managed to explain all of this we could probably do well with some of this explanation in current affairs. <laughs> yes, it makes uh, everyone. Uh, it explains uh, every everyone's uh, case. <laughs> yes, and okay. So this was Plato. I don't remember how long BC Plato was. Do you remember? I'm not sure. He was born in four hundred and twenty-eight before. Jesus Christ. Right. Okay, so Plato was 427 BC, and so human beings had already established this clear and understanding of the relationship between the sexes and homosexuality 400 years before Christ, easily. That's a very interesting fact. Yes, and I think the reason why uh, he was a... Uh, um, explaining homosexuality is because uh, I think most of the philosophers were homosexual. So oh, they may have been, yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's what, this was the explanation. <laughs> yeah, and uh, at this period of, in this cultural context, it, there was no, there was no uh, discrimination ab uh, against homosexual people. Right. It happened uh, later or in other cultural context. Yeah, obviously. Uh, I think the church may have had something to do with that. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Probably. What I wanted to say is that he explains the origin of love, the fact that we are half a, a person. Right. That, that we are not a whole person and we feel the pain of being separated from our other half. And we have this intuition that if we find our other half, then we will be a whole human being and it will e heal our innate pain. Our innate what? Pain, suffering. Oh, uh, our the, innate pain. It will yeah. heal our innate pain. Okay. In real life, we may not interpret it literally, but it has a significance in uh, uh, mythology. Star Wars is a, is a modern day myth. The same uh, archetypes are coming into play. <laughs> and, right. the uh, same, we say uh, the same architects are being constellated. Constellated, yes. Yeah. 
it talks about the same story that uh, there was the prime Jedi who was the whole uh, man and then he was separated into uh, the dark side of the force and the light side of the force. So there was a, a conflict between the Sith and the Jedi who, hold, who held different values. That's why the movies are called Star Wars because it's the war between these two factions. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> in the, the prequels, we, we have more explanation how the, the war happened. Is it your opinion, Sophie, that the producers of Star Wars and the writers of Star Wars had this broad uh, mythological Yes, uh, George idea. Lucas had okay. Okay, but Lu was Lucas involved in the in the three yes. episodes one through three? Yes, okay. he was. Uh, actually, he was involved in the six first movies. He was the creator. He may not have directed the six ones, but he he was uh, involved in 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 them in the six of them. Okay, and uh, he he really uh, he he was a student of uh, Joseph Campbell. Right. And Joseph Campbell said he was his best student. So he was uh, very much interested in mythology. Right. Okay, that I, that I do understand. Okay, so go ahead. But then the, the sequel trilogy, we had two uh, directors. And uh, we had uh, J.J. Abrams, who, dir who directed the uh, seventh movie. The Star, The Force Awakens, and the last one, The Rise of Skywalker, and Ryan Johnson, who directed the eighth movie, The Last Jedi. I'm not sure J.J. Uh, J. J. Abrams studied these things. Uh, I have no information about this. Okay. However, so yeah, okay. However, uh, Ryan just Johnson studied Jungian psychology. Okay. And so he was the director of the eighth movie. Yes. He, he, he did not study in university, but he, he did some preparation. He read some books about and listened to lectures about Indian psychology. As you know, I wouldn't criticize anybody like that since that's how I am. <laughs> 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 and I, I probably you are. Did you ever take any courses in this in university? No, never. I studied IT in university. <laughs> you studied IT, I think. <laughs> so you and I had this exchange a few weeks ago where you were very excited to see The Rise of Skywalker. And then the night before I was to see it, you said you're not going to see it because you had a spoiler happen you you saw a spoiler and the uh, movie, intentionally uh, yeah you intentionally. you intentionally were not going to see it because you you'd seen a spoiler and no i i wanted to say that i was in, intentionally uh, looking for spoilers so it was not accidental oh, okay all right <laughs> so so you were intentionally looking for spoilers and when you found them you were so turned off by the result in the last movie that you said to me you weren't going to see it. So I said, hmm, okay. So I was going to see it the next day, and I came out of the movie pretty excited because I actually liked the movie and liked the ending. And so I wonder if you would explain why you were upset about it, and then I can talk about why I liked it. Yes, uh, actually there are s several reasons. So I, ha I have seen the movie later uh, yes. when I've been able to recover from uh, uh, my trauma, <laughs> <laughs> my shocked. disappointment. Yeah. And so I, I was more able to go with a an analytical mind uh, <laughs> see the, the movie with my father. Oh. And uh, so I can say what I liked about it, it was it, that it was entertaining. And I think that for someone who 
is not attached to the characters and who just want to have fun, he may like the movie. But if you care about the myth and the character's psychology, the depiction of the internal uh, struggle of the characters, then you may not like the movie. <laughs> thinks I have a plan which will humble their pride and improve their manners. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Me, I have to read that again.